It's a great honor to be back here in Sweden. I was here for the public policy forum, and uh, the mayor had an opportunity to uh, welcome us and uh, talk about uh, what a wonderful, wired city it is, and how much creativity was going on in Stockholm. And at the same time, I had uh, uh, a chance to visit uh, with uh, Minister Larson. I had an opportunity to visit with the police department and meet with their drug squad, a drug squad that believes that in a very balanced way they can do a very good job of not just interdicting and impacting the problems of drugs, but of keeping young people from being involved in drugs and from uh, and for those that need drug treatment, helping them down a path of, uh, of drug treatment. So uh, to be here for your second uh, convention is very important. You have obviously looking at the agenda, listening to the speakers that preceded me, and the people that are here in the audience you obviously have the right people here. You are certainly in the right country, in the right city to discuss this clearly global health and public safety problem. As uh, uh, UNODC Director uh, Costa uh, so eloquently described the problems that are affecting us. Let me talk about a couple of things. I had the opportunity over a 37-year career in law enforcement to look at the problem of drugs as a police officer, as a drug squad commander, and uh, later for a number of years, the last nine years in Seattle, Washington, as a, as a chief of police. Uh, I have never heard my colleagues in law enforcement, whether in the United States or really uh, the many uh, friends that I have gained around the world, I had never heard my colleagues talk about a war on drugs. And in fact, they talked about the, uh, the, the, you could not arrest your way out of the problem, that you needed a very balanced and a comprehensive strategy to deal with the drug problem that existed in their jurisdictions, Oftentimes, that was at the city or the county or the, or the state level. Uh, and then a balanced strategy meant involving a lot of other people and a lot of other collaborations and partnerships uh, to look at the drug problem in a more holistic way and to achieve better outcomes. And that is some of the things when you have a chance to listen to uh, later on an explanation of the HOPE project that has gone on in Hawaii uh, other programs and initiatives and ideas that are being experimented with in the United States because clearly we are moving away from just approaching the problem from a criminal justice lens. Uh, too often, uh, law enforcement agencies, because we were 24-7, uh, we were pretty easy to recognize because we drove around in cars that looked a little bit different. Uh, we had a pretty easy number in the United States to remember, three digits, 911, and you could call on us to kind of fix all of the problems. You could call on police departments uh, to repair and, uh, and prevent and fix a lot of issues. The mental illness that exists on the streets in many cities is clearly a medical problem, but yet too often it was handed to the police. And when young children, younger children, were not attending school and were skipping school, well, it was pretty easy to hand that to the police. And if they were staying out too late and getting themselves into trouble and putting themselves in harm's way, you could ask the police to, uh, to enforce some type of curfew law. We've changed dramatically in the way we approach these things as police. We wanted to do our share of the job. We wanted to do our share of the responsibility. We needed to be at the table when solutions were discussed, but we didn't need to be at the head of the table. There are very smart people in education, in health, and in uh, uh, post-arrest treatment programs that should be involved and should be at the head of the table. And they need to be adequately resourced. They need the funds and the treatment. Very rarely in a law enforcement agency does a mayor, city council, or others wish to cut the police department budget. And yet other programs that have as much impact and potential impact on keeping a community safe, those programs were often cut. 
And right now, as the United States and other world economies go through very difficult times, we're seeing these cuts take place in programs that exist within our prison walls to try and keep or to try and uh, give people drug programs, drug prevention and treatment programs. Those programs are being cut and being reduced. We're seeing a number of other programs in the community being reduced. And that's why we looked very hard during this difficult economic time as an opportunity for change. When I first accepted this job a year ago and I met with President Obama uh, and said, you know, one of our most important tasks is to develop your national drug control strategy. And he gave me some instructions. Now, I think there's some very smart people that could have over a weekend put that thing together and then, uh, and then rolled it out. He said, I'd like you to go out and get as many voices of the American people in that strategy. And that's exactly what we did. We traveled all over the country and we listened to many, many, many people. Uh, not just law enforcement experts, because I think that we had uh, a number of those, but people in uh, the ran drug treatment programs, people that taught prevention programs, people that were in treatment programs. Uh, we talked to many young people, we listened to many people, and we found out a great deal about what should be in that strategy. And we think that the strategy that the President released two weeks ago today is a strategy that is very balanced and it's very comprehensive. And it says it's not a war on drugs, but it said that we should be bringing a lot of other people uh, with us and along with the, with the uh, groups involved in prevention and involved in treatment. The uh, fact that uh, drug treatment should be a part of primary health care and should not be this separate, standalone uh, type of system. All of these things need to be knitted together. Now, the president asked me a question. He said, well, do you really think we can make progress? Because right now, there are a lot of things occurring in the world. And right now, the uh, uh, economy in the United States does not lend itself to lots of new money. And I said, Mr. President, I actually think the wind is at our backs. You know, Americans, we're all very optimistic about, uh, about everything. But I said, I think the wind is at our backs. Uh, I think that uh, the economic uh, difficulties that we're facing have forced states and counties, which is where most of the work gets done in the United States. Uh, for those not familiar with inside the Beltway and inside Washington, D.C., all good ideas don't come from Washington, D.C. All good ideas don't flow out. Actually, the vast majority of the good ideas, the programs, the projects, the things that work, are developed at the grassroots level. And then they're applied and uh, implemented within our cities and our counties by a lot of very smart, caring, dedicated people. We can only be a help at the federal government level. We can only encourage things. Things that Dr. Dross talked about, such as evidence-based and science-based information. But what occurs, what, what, what is important to the emotional context of all of the discussion that will be going on, not only this morning, but probably as importantly during your coffee breaks and other uh, and tea breaks, just as importantly, there will be lots of discussion about things that are working well in Australia and things that are working well in New Zealand. And you'll be hearing from other countries and other groups about things that haven't worked so well. And those lessons will be just as important as this very important uh, second convention progresses over the next two days. Let me mention a couple things about President Obama's strategy and the key themes that are in it. And some of which we were able to support with requests by the President to our Congress for new money additional money in treatment, and additional money in prevention. Community-based prevention, and I did mention that almost everything good that occurs in our country occurs at a small level, at a grassroots level. Community-based prevention, and that's the largest percentage increase that the President has asked for, about 13% in the budget. Early intervention. Substance abuse results in over $50 billion in health care spending annually. Most of these funds are expended on avoidable, catastrophic consequences of addiction. Emergency room visits rather than addiction treatment. 
and it's time to expand, expand, expand screening breach intervention uh, referral to treatment. And when I was the police chief in, in Seattle, one of the cities that, that one of the areas of the country in which this was experimented upon. Because quite frankly, people in our country and people in your countries trust their healthcare professionals. They believe that their healthcare professional is looking out for them. And when that occurs, and I go in uh, and say, you know, I have this mold and it should be looked at. I'm concerned about it. And the doctor says, and oh, by the way, how much do you drink? And what do you drink? And oh, by the way, do you use any substances? That doctor, in a very short period of time, or that other healthcare professional, can make some very determined ideas about what I should be doing. Gil, you know, perhaps you need to be doing something uh, uh, differently about substances, or you need to be doing something. I trust that healthcare professional, as most people do around the world. If we can intervene early, we have much greater successes. And not only do we have the chance of greater success in early intervention, we actually save money because it's done at an early time. Treatment and recovery at uh, ONDCP at our office, we just opened up a recovery office because we want to put an additional focus on recovery, something that's not often talked about. And if you ask me 10 years or 12 years ago about drug treatment, I would have said these are people that just have a terrible moral failure. And if only they would straighten up, and if only they would find God or, whatever, or whoever they believe in, then they could become much better. But we know that treatment is so much more complex than that. And so the Obama administration is very interested in making sure people understand that addiction is a disease and should be treated as, as a disease. But it is not a disease that uh, responsibility is not attached to. Because if you don't exercise, and you smoke, and you drink a little bit too much, and uh, you're, you're not able to control your weight, and on and on, we know that all of those things can have a disastrous effect on your health. And even though then you, uh, you become, uh, uh, you may have a, a, a disease that, uh, that certainly you can't prevent, but all of those things can have an effect. So treating addiction as a disease does not mean that people are not, do not uh, bear responsibility. Drugs and crime, the criminal justice system plays an important part in reducing drug use and its consequences. And too often when I talk to people about uh, particularly uh, groups of reporters, too often when I talk to them, we see and hear and understand all of the pro-drug messages that are given to young people but the part that is always missing in those pro-drug messages are the consequences. What are the consequences of drug use? Well, after 37 years in law enforcement, I think I got to see the consequences of drug use. Um, after a rave party in which ecstasy had been widely, uh, widely used, but perhaps not by the perpetrator, uh, at uh, about 7 o'clock in the morning, I was called on a Saturday morning. And they said, uh, we have six young people, the youngest being 14, have been found murdered, shot to death in a house. Uh, two more have been transported to a hospital in Seattle because they have been shot and wounded. And when a very alert uh, police officer early in that morning heard the call of the gunshots and confronted the gunman and the gunman saw him, the gunman then put the gun under his own chin and uh, killed himself in front of the police officer. All of those young people, rather than going home uh, after the party, had, uh, after, a, after a rave party, all of them had attended a party afterwards, in which even uh, for the youngest uh, victim being 14 years of age, there was evidence, of course, of alcohol and, and, and other things being used. Now, I'm not linking that violence to that particular drug or that particular party, but it is impossible not to talk about the nexus of drugs and crime and violence and realize that if we approach this in a balanced and comprehensive way, that we have the opportunity not just to improve people's lives, not just to improve uh, and protect, as, as Dr. Madra said, the brain, but we also have a chance to improve public safety. We have that ability to reduce some of the crimes 
that have linkages with drugs. And we know in 10 parts of the United States, in a program that was done away with, except for the fact that my office uh, several years ago was able to preserve a small part of it, we know that we tested people who were arrested throughout the country. And they were tested for the drugs that they were on. And it, and it didn't matter whether they were arrested for domestic violence or uh, driving under the influence of alcohol or shoplifting. And we saw that in one city, Chicago, 80% of the people being tested were, under, were involved with some type of drug abuse. And I think the lowest was about 50% somewhere else. So everything we do to prevent young people from being involved in drugs, everything we do to have evidence-based treatment programs that are successful has the potential to not just equal one plus one to two, but it has the ability to go one plus one could equal three and four and five because it can reduce money spent by taxpayers, it can save needed uh, emergency department facilities uh, for trauma care uh, admissions, and it can improve the quality of life within neighborhoods and within communities. So we're on a mission. We're on a huge and important mission. Drug trafficking organizations are truly these transnational criminal enterprises. I've often been asked, particularly on my three visits to Mexico, uh, often been asked by uh, uh, others there, well, wouldn't we just eliminate many of the violence problems in Mexico if drugs, in fact, were legalized? That would not be the case. All of the horrible acts of violence that President Calderon is so courageously taking on in that country to reduce and eliminate, I don't see the people that are perpetrating those acts of violence. I don't see them suddenly saying, you know what, if marijuana becomes legal, that is a fairly significant amount of our profits. Uh, uh, I think we'll go and grow and we'll go grow corn, or we're going to go to work for Coca-Cola or Microsoft. It isn't going to happen. And yet we, we kind of have a lot of people, highly educated, very smart, very sophisticated people, reaching out and grasping for what we like to say in the United States is a silver bullet and that silver bullet being drug legalization. Uh, we know it's not, and we know that, as you probably know better than I, we know that if you just scratch the surface of all of those arguments why legalization makes so much sense, that when you scratch the surface and dig just a little bit below, you'll find that all of those arguments disappear, and they disappear completely. So it's not an answer, and the Obama administration has made it pointedly clear that they have no interest in engaging in discussion. Uh, uh, legalization is, is a non-starter, as we like to say. It is off the table, uh, but the question comes up repeatedly. Our international partnerships are important. Uh, they're very important not only in law enforcement, because we recognize that the criminals really don't care about jurisdiction. When I was police chief in Seattle, I was quite happy if crime was outside the city of Seattle. Now I don't have that opportunity. I have to, uh, I, I have to look at things from a much larger uh, perspective, uh, particularly around drugs. But I also have this opportunity to look at things from a much larger perspective uh, when it comes to the global problems that are created. I've never been in a community, particularly a community of color, in which people said, you know, we're really for drug legalization or we really want less policing. I've never heard that. I've always heard we want more responsive and professional and caring policing. And if there is a drug dealer in the neighborhood, we don't want that person impacting our neighbors and our family and our community. On the other hand, we don't want the punishment to be so severe that for the next 25 years we're raising his children and we're taking care of his property because of a, a prison sentence uh, that is abnormally harsh. And that's why the Obama administration has taken a position on what's called the sentencing disparity between crack cocaine and powder cocaine. We also recognize that in this complex problem of drugs, that we can't agree on everything. We have to seek common ground 
and we have to avoid uh, engaging in lengthy ideological debates. Uh, free market economy and Milton Friedman are of interest to many people here. And I know you spend a lot of time thinking about that. Uh, in my 37 years of law enforcement and spending a lot of time in neighborhoods that were impacted by drugs, I really didn't find many of those heavy discussions. What I found is people wanted common sense, they wanted quality programs that could be helpful, they wanted the same thing that everyone else wanted, of course, safety and security, uh, good schools for their children, and, and, and of course, jobs. Uh, I think we've made the position of the United States very clear in these repeated interviews about legalization. Uh, we've made it very clear about marijuana. In the United States, more people are dependent on marijuana than uh, other drugs. The treatment call-in centers, not the ones that you have to go to a, a center because the court has sent you, but where you voluntarily pick up the phone and say, I have a problem and I need help. The number one call after alcohol is for marijuana. So we're opposed to legalizing marijuana or any other drugs. Uh, I'd like to close by emphasizing how important and beneficial your work is and how much it is supported uh, by people within the United States at the community level, but also by elected officials who look very closely at the successes that you've had. I thank you very much for the opportunity to talk about President Obama's drug strategy. I uh, welcome a uh, uh, chance to engage in further discussion while I'm here today. And we have several people that will be staying throughout the conference. Uh, and I am just truly sorry that I actually don't have that opportunity <coughs> to sit through and listen to some of the discussion. Uh, because I find it enriching and fulfilling and I feel quite comfortable with this audience. So please know you have a friend and a partner in the United States. Thank you all very much.